All right, so we're going to start with the war in the Soviet Union, but I'm going to go here first and play this. I'm go forward. Hopefully you can hear it okay. But I'm going to let that play in the background. Oh, maybe I'm not. Okay, so this is the war in the Soviet Union. Okay, um, and so that song, which I'll get to in a minute, this is the Nazis. Okay. And this is what they controlled. The red is everything that they controlled in 1942, 43. This is the height of their power. Okay, this is where they are at their utmost, right? Okay, so let me do this again. I'm going to go here. We'll see if you guys recognize this song. You probably won't. It's an 80s hit. So you can be thankful you weren't born in the 70s. You didn't have to listen to this music, although it's pretty good. So in case you can't hear that, the name of this song is Burning Down the House. Okay, which seems super weird. Okay, but Burning Down the House, right, is the name of this. That's going to make sense, okay, to what we're talking about. Here it comes. Burning Down the House. All right, here we go. All right, so... There we go. All right, so the Nazi Soviet Pact. You guys remember this from the timeline? You can kind of see it over there behind me. Okay, Germany and Russia would not attack each other. Okay, in a shocking development, uh, you guys won't believe this, right? But Hitler broke his promise. <gasps> what a shock. Right? You're totally surprised. <gasps> oh, more surprise. Oh, my gosh. Right? Oh, Lucille Ball is shocked. All right. Oh, emojis are shocked. Oh, teenage girl is shocked. Okay, by such events. Right. He said he needed lead and srum. So you should have your yellow packet. Okay, mine is blue. Uh, on the yellow packet, this one is called War in the Soviet Union. Okay. See, so the agreement was the Nazi Soviet Pact. Okay. Uh, the Germans said they need living space in German. Okay. That is lead and srum. That's up there. Okay, remember, that was one of Hitler's excuses why he needed to go and get more space. So they're going to invade the Soviet Union. Okay, I'm going to go back to this. Woo! Okay, so you can see where Poland is. Remember, that was a Nazi-Soviet pact. They split it in half. Then he's going to invade. You see how far they go there between the red and the green. Okay, places like Stalingrad, Leningrad, and almost all the way to Moscow. Of course, the Russians knew this was coming. Joseph Stalin knew that Hitler was going to break his promise. So they were definitely ready I just love looking at those faces. They were definitely ready, right? Okay, so uh, I'm going to play this video clip for you. I want you to come up with three facts from this, okay? And then tell me what the main idea of the video clip is, okay? All right, here we go. <laughs> June 1941, the roar of artillery and the rumble of tanks marked the end of the unlikely pact between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Okay, so it says 22 June 1941. It's important to note that. That might be one of your three facts, right? This starts in June of 1941. The weather in Russia, in Stalingrad especially, is very similar to what it is here. It may be a little bit cooler in the winter, okay, which they're going to find out it's a lot colder this particular winter, but it starts in June. Okay, or the Russians are going to, the Germans are going to unleash their blitzkrieg on to the Russians. As he has before, Adolf Hitler unleashes his blitzkrieg on a nation with which he is supposedly at peace. Known as Operation Barbarossa, the German offensive into Russia is the largest in history. Three million men pour through massive holes punched by panzer divisions in the Russian defenses. The German offensive is divided into three wings. The main thrust of the attack is given to Field Marshal von Barth's Army Group Center. They have to drive east in a giant pincers movement towards Smolensk, and trapping and crushing large elements of the Red Army. With this done, they are to push on to Moscow and raise the Nazi banner high above the walls of the Kremlin. Okay, so the Red Army, that's the Russians. Okay, so this is the Nazis. Barbarossa is the name of this, and they're invading the Soviet Union. As in Poland and France, the German blitzkrieg routes the Russian defenders, driving them back in utter confusion. On 29 June, 
veterinarians and general hunts forces meeting up near Minsk, encircling more than 40 Russian divisions and taking over 300,000 prisoners. In the south, the work is overrun, and the first panzer group is already making advances on Kiev. On 3 July, Stalin broadcasts a message to the entire nation. He says the current conflict is a people's war, not just one for the Red Army. He calls for a scorched earth policy, leaving nothing for the advancing Germans. Okay, you remember the song that I was playing? It said, burning down the house, right? That lady just burned down her own house. She took a torch and lit her house on fire. Okay, now not every Russian did this, but there were tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of them that did this. They fled. They knew that the Germans were coming and the Nazis were brutal and they did not want to be around. And so they would literally burn their house down and they would just retreat further in to Russia to get away from them and hoping that, that their, the army was going to be able to stop them. But they weren't going to leave anything behind for them to take. Okay, that's how serious they were about this. By 5 August, the Army Group Center has encircled over 700,000 Soviet troops at Smolensk. On 12 August, Hitler issues Directive 34, ordering Army Groups north and south to continue their drives to Leningrad and the Crimea. But he also orders, against the advice of his generals, that Army Group Center halt and assist the other forces. The German generals want to continue the drive for Moscow virtually ensuring its fall before the Russian winter sets in. Russian roads, bad enough in favorable weather, become impassable in snow. Okay, so the generals knew that they needed to get in there quickly, okay, before the winter set in, and they could have done it, but Hitler didn't listen to them. He thought he knew better. Good thing he th thought he was better than them, because it could have been a real, real disaster if they would have won. The generals realize that the key to their success is mobility. Without it, they fear, the offensive will bog down and they will find themselves fighting in an environment for which they are totally unprepared. On 30 August, Army Group North cuts the last railroad link between Leningrad and the rest of the Soviet Union. The next day, they are within artillery range of the city itself. In the south, okay. So hopefully you guys remember from your map or something. Leningrad's way up north, and then Moscow's kind of in the middle, and then Stalingrad's further down in the south. Okay, so Leningrad's cut off, and they're gonna you're, they're gonna literally try to starve the people of Leningrad to death to get them to submit, and they won't. They refuse. That's in Leningrad. Stalingrad's where this is heading. Guderian, who is driven south after the encirclement at Smolensk, joins in the assault on Kiev. On 12 September, his forces link up with General Kleist's and trapping over 600,000 Soviet troops 100 miles west of the city. For all the good news, the German general staff is most preoccupied with weather. The first snow falls on the eastern front. On 19 September, after losing half a million men in its defense, the Russians are forced to see Kiev to army group south. Okay, so it's September and it already started snowing. Okay, in September. Remember, the weather there is like it is here, but it's snowing in September. Whew. For the Germans, the victory is bittersweet at best. The fierce Russian defense of the city has reduced the Nazi forces by over 100,000. One German general notes that, unlike the Poles and the French, the Russians are fighting to the last man. On 30 September, the Guderian 2nd Panzer Army, which has moved back north, begins the drive east of Moscow. He is joined on 2 October by the 3rd and 4th Panzer Groups and the 2nd, 4th and 9th Armies. Though the advance on Moscow continues, the closer the Germans get to the city, the top of the fighting comes. Accustomed to winning staggering victories at little cost, they are now bogged down and taking heavy casualties. By mid-November, with hard winter descending around them, German morale is at an all-time low. The soldiers do not have proper clothing to protect them from the cold, and their equipment is becoming less and less reliable. Because here's something to keep in mind. So, like, Berlin is over here. Whoop, Berlin is over here. 
and they got to go all the way, all the way, all the way over here to get where Stalingrad and, and Moscow. Right. So they're like the distance of, say, between uh, Los Angeles to almost New York, maybe not quite that far, Los Angeles to St. Louis. And so they got to ship all that stuff and they, they don't have it. And so they left in the summer, equipped for the summer, and now they're going to be trapped in the winter in the Soviet Union. And it's going to be crazy freezing cold, way colder than it has been in a long time and way colder than most winters in Stalingrad. Winter may well be Russia's best ally. The Red Army, reeling from the speed of the German advance, now has time to regroup. They permit the Germans to advance slowly on Moscow while building their reserve forces on the outer flanks. On 2 December, forward German units advance to within sight of the Kremlin. Their divisions are at half strength. Their men are demoralized and frostbitten and their equipment is failing miserably in the harsh Russian winter. Their long drive stalls. On 6 December, the Russian hammer drops along a 500-mile front around Moscow, the Soviets... Okay, so I missed a little bit. It's hard to get the timing right on this. But you got to think of it this way. They kind of lured them in, right? They lured the Nazis in, and the Nazis just kept coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. And then it got freezing cold, which was a lucky break. They had no control over that. And then, man, as soon as they got them lured in and they were far away, they surrounded them. Okay, they brought their, their armies around and trapped them in there, and then they just bombed them mercilessly and attacked them from everywhere they could possibly attack them from. They suckered them in, and the Nazis took it. And then the Red Army, the Soviets, surrounded them and just let them have it. It's a great plan, right? Now, the problem was this plan had already been done like a couple hundred years ago, and Hitler knew it. Okay, the same thing happened to Napoleon. And Hitler knew his history and knew that Napoleon did this, but yet he continued to try to do this, which shows that the phrase, those who don't know the past are condemned to repeat it. Hitler even knew the past, but thought he was so good that he could take it. Okay, and it's going to cost him. It's going to cost him big time. Launch a massive counteroffensive. Devised by Marshal Georgi Zukov, the Russian plan is to cut through the Panzer troops on the wings of Army Group Center isolate and destroy it. The overextended, weakened German forces crumble under the onslaught of the fresh Russian troops. Hitler, for the first time, sees his mighty Wehrmacht stagger. Facing a rejuvenated Red Army, the German High Command looks forward with trepidation to the long Russian winter. Okay, so this is right the first time that they lose something right the nazis are finally stopped here okay so uh which thank goodness right they get stopped so that's a really good thing so you should have three facts from that and then the main idea of that clip okay which i kind of just gave to you right uh all right so i'm going to try to adjust this just a little all right so uh let's keep going forward here take a look at this death toll right so you see this, the Soviet Union, that's Russia. Look at them. They're up to 24 million people, okay, died. That's military deaths combined with civilians. Look at the number of civilians in orange, okay? Civilian deaths are in orange. That means almost 12 million Russian people, because of that invasion, died right now. That's 1942 that you just saw. That started in 41, ended in 42, okay? And then they're going to fight again and in, in, in more in 42. Uh D-Day, we don't invade Western Europe, okay, France, until 1944. Now, we're fighting, and at this point when you're watching, we're down in Africa. We're fighting in Ethiopia, and then we go to Sicily and go to Anzio, and our, the way we're fighting in Italy is brutal, but it's not really occupying the Nazi war machine, okay? The Nazi war machine is full force on the Soviet Union. Stalin wanted our help, and we said no, okay? So here's more of the numbers, right? The Allied, look at that. 10 million, 10 million, they say 20 million, okay, deaths. It's probably more closer to 25 million. This is a conservative estimate. Look at the United States, 400,000, which means more people have died from the coronavirus than died in World War II fighting for the United States, which is crazy, okay? So uh, these numbers are staggering, right, especially the ones in the Soviet Union. They are the ones that suffered the most. All right, so this invasion begins in June of 1941. 
Okay, and this should go back to your graphic organizer, right? Yours is yellow, mine's blue, they're the same thing. Okay, this goes from the Baltic Sea, so on your maps, okay, that you guys are getting back either today or tomorrow, uh, the Baltic Sea down to the Black Sea is where this invasion, they invade the whole, they take everything they have and throw it at the Russians. Three and a half million troops. Okay, logistically, this is unbelievable to do this with this many people. This would be like taking everybody in the St. Louis metropolitan area Every one of us, whether you're from Belleville or Alton or Chesterfield or Sular, doesn't matter. Every one of us would be invading the, the Russians. That's how many Soviet troops, excuse me, that's how many Nazi troops were invading at the same time. Okay, so at the beginning, it's going to be great until the Russians lure them in far enough. Okay, so the Soviets weren't prepared. They execute, they execute the scorched earth policy, burning down the house, right? Stalin wants us in the war. He begs us. Okay, and FDR says we can't do that. We can't invade. We have to, you know, have a process here, right? He wanted us to invade Western Europe. He wanted us to invade France. So then the Nazis would have to fight over here and the Nazis have to fight over here. Okay, right now, all the Nazis can just go this way against the Soviet Union. Okay, FDR said we're going to go through North Africa and Italy instead. So Stalin, even though he's on our side, not happy about that. Okay, so there's Leningrad up in the north. Okay, Stalingrad down in the south. But man, like, uh, you can't even see Germany on this map. That's how far away they were from Germany fighting this war, which is why once they get to Stalingrad and it gets to be freezing cold, and it's freezing cold in Leningrad, they got a huge problem on their hands because they're so far away from their uh, home base and where they're going to get their equipment from. And then the lines get cut off, so they got nothing, and they're that far away. Uh, okay, so Stalingrad. First of all, I would tell you guys about movies, man. There's a great movie called Enemy at the Gates. Okay, the book is better, and it's unreal, the stuff that these people go through. There's a story in the book of this German uh, leader who sees somebody on the side of the road, and they're going like this, and they're waving their hands because they need help, and they're just frantic. And he, he can tell that it's a Russian soldier, and he feels terrible. Like He's like, oh, my gosh, this guy really needs help. Like He can see the thought he was bleeding, and this is a mess, right? So he even though he's on the other side, he gets up close enough to the guy and he can see that the guy has been hit, okay, by a, a mortar, a shell from somewhere, and it's literally only the top half of the guy's body. And he's freaking out. He can, he obviously, he's going to bleed to death. He's going to die. That's the kind of grotesque stuff that people see every day, okay, in these battles. And this goes on day after day after day after day, okay? Um, so Stalingrad is... The summer of 42, and I need to check my date on that, just in time for the winter, right? The rubble, when this is over with, in the city is so deep that the Germans cannot get their tanks through the streets anymore. The Russians let the buildings blow up. They were fine with it. Sometimes they blew up the building themselves. They, what they would do is house themselves in the building, and they would fight like snipers from certain windows, and they would fight like crazy, right? And then they would sneak out, and then they would blow the building to smithereens after they did this for a week or two. Okay, and then the, the, all the bricks and stuff would be in the roads, and then the Germans couldn't advance through the city. They literally were going street by street, building by building through Stalingrad. Okay, and the Russians were absolutely brutal. And these are civilians. These are like little kids acting as spies. These are women acting as spies. These are women using uh, rifles to kill the troops, the German troops. I mean, it's, unbel it's unbelievable what the people of Russia did. Right, so... Uh, after the war was over with, the outskirts of Stalingrad, which is, like I said, just like here, it's good farmland, it's steppe region, real flat. They couldn't grow anything because they had to get all the metal from the shell casings and the bullets. They had to get it all of it out of the ground from laying on top of the ground. That's how much stuff was there. Okay, the Soviets are going to win this battle because of the bitter winter, winter. Okay, they surround the Germans, right, and... They're eventually going to freeze them out, if you will. The German soldiers in this situation, they, they got no support from back home. Hitler, for lack of a better phrase, Hitler screwed them over. Okay, the soldiers would try and hold on to the planes, the wings of the planes, okay, so they could hold on to get out. That's what they would try to do because they knew if they stayed, they were going to die. The soldiers would get in fistfights and literally beat the living daylights of it, out of each other. The German soldiers would beat the daylights out of other German soldiers to try to get into the plane. They weren't even supposed to get in the plane. The plane's supposed to be carrying cargo, and these guys would throw themselves in the plane. There were times that the Germans were supposed to be cargo, so they got the command, and they had to shoot their own guys 
to keep them off the planes. Okay, it was crazy. Hitler was supposed to be supplying them, you know, daily, and they didn't. They got a small fraction of what they were promised, and so these guys had nothing, and so they they starved to death. Some of them, they were so weak, they there's no way they could fight. Okay, it's a great plan by the Soviets. It was costly. They lost at least half a million troops. The city of Stalingrad itself went from 850,000 to 1,500 by the end of the battle. That's amazing. Now, some of those people left the city. Some of those people died in the city. Okay, but if you lived in the city, you, you got out because you couldn't survive if you stayed. Your chances weren't very good. So the Germans, okay, the Axis, because it wasn't all Germans. There were Italians. There were uh, Romanians, right? They, but their entire Sixth Army, they lost. Okay, the Russians killed all of them. 800,000 of them were dead. Uh, 90,000 of them were taken prisoner. Out of those 90,000, 5,000 of them survived the war. The Russians didn't care about the Axis prisoners. They could care less. They did not treat them humanely, and they died. And if they died, they died. Whatever. If they got diseases in the prison, they got diseases in the prison. 5,000 of them survived. It was brutal. Uh, here's some pictures from when it's over with. I mean, that's incredible, right, how bad it looks. And then there's that map again. You can see the red goes all the way to Stalingrad. Okay, it goes all the way to Moscow. It goes past Leningrad, right? They, the Nazis had a total chokehold on the mainland of Europe. This is going to be the beginning, beginning of the end of it. Now, what the Russians are going to do is they're going to start pushing back the other direction. They're going to push back towards Germany. Okay, and it's going to take them a little bit, almost three years to get back to Germany fighting against the Nazis. But at the same time, then we're going to invade in France Okay, and then we're going to start going towards Berlin. It creates another zit, if you will, um, in Germany instead of in Tunisia like it was in North Africa. Okay, so there's a picture of those German bombers. You think you could hold on to that plane wing for very long? Uh, but that tells you how desperate those guys were to get out of there. All right, so that brings us to the end of that. You should have all of this filled out now, okay, from what was on there. Okay, this one was the war in the Soviet Union. Okay, the German invasion and Stalingrad.